In chapter 25, the book of Isaiah, very, very, very um, um, prophetic. If you didn't know, uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah wrote about 700 B.C., more specifically about 720 or so B.C. We're going to hopefully cover chapters 25 and 26 tonight. Isaiah ended the last chapter, chapter 24, uh, with the end of the Great Tribulation. If you didn't know, the Bible says that there's going to come a time that he's talked all about in plain detail uh, the 70th week of the book of Daniel. And that is called the Great Tribulation. We've talked about it before. We're going to get some more specifics. But more specifically, what happens on the other side? When Jesus comes back down to the planet, planet Earth, and he sets foot, and then with a word from his mouth, suddenly all of the enemies of God are done and gone. Hey, that book of Revelation stuff, I've been meaning to ask you about that, Pastor Steve. Why is God so mad, and why is he trashing his own planet? And as we've said before, it's not God doing a lot of the destruction. It's humankind as God takes his hand of provision and protection. You think planet Earth is cuckoo now. The Lord, when he re removes his restraining ability, there's a whole lot of terrible things that don't happen because God is not allowing it. But in the seven-year Great Tribulation, God is going to take his hands off of planet Earth, and he's going to let humans go nuts on other humans, and he's going, to go, he's going to let the demons go nuts on the humans, and there's terrible destruction, there's death, and, and even sulfur smoke, and darkness, some of the judgments. That's not God wrecking the planet. That's God allowing planet Earth to smell, and to, to taste, to feel, and to sense more and more what hell is actually like. Yeah, about that too, Steve. If God is such a God of love, why did he even invent a hell? Hell is an awful place, and Jesus taught a lot about it. Why? Because he doesn't want anybody to go there. Well, why could God do that? Here's what God does. He has constructed a place that is separate from him. It wasn't intended for humans, but humans are going to go there because they literally dug their heels in whenever God tried to knock on the door of their heart. So all that God does is he makes a place that is separate from where he lives. He made it for the angel, or for the fallen angels known as demons, and he's effectively giving them exactly what they want, an eternity without him. It is so awful and horrific because what do people and what do demons, fallen angels, what are they like if they have no semblance of anything that is God. That's what makes it so very, very terrible. So God is going to give planet Earth a seven-year taste of something that is very similar. It's not, but it's similar to what hell will be like. It's almost like God is saying, really? Seriously? You would prefer this, this taste of the seven-year tribulation to me? That's the Great Tribulation. Chapter 25 and chapter 26 are going to talk about after that's done. When Jesus returns to planet Earth, he dispatches all of the God-hating, Jesus-rejecting people. And don't forget, he's had angels flying across the sky throughout the duration, broadcasting the gospel. You don't have to go through this. You have the 144,000 uh, supernaturally protected from all these judgments and stuff flying around. Could it be nukes? Could it be natural um, sort of disasters? I don't know. But these 144,000, 12,000 each from the 12 tribes of Israel, it doesn't affect them. They're also telling people what they need to do to get saved. It's not hard. But it seems that most of the humans will dig their heels in. No, 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 no. It's a head scratcher. Let's get some more details when it's all done. Chapter 25, verse 1. Oh, Lord, says Isaiah, you are my God. And I will exalt you and I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. Your counsels, you could probably write in there, prophecies. Your prophecies of old are faithfulness and truth. For you... In the Great Tribulation, you made a city singular a ruin. 
A fortified city, singular, a ruin. A palace, singular, of foreigners, to be a city no more, and it will never be rebuilt. What city is he talking about? Well, he's talking about Fernley, because you know Fernley's a rough thing. No, he's talking about Babylon. Babylon, that the devil um, prompted Nimrod in following, it started out with the Tower of Babel, and it was a whole society predicated on life without God. We don't need you, God. We're going to build our own thing here. And of course, God confused the languages at that point because look when humans put their mind to it and collaborate, look what they can come up with. This kind of nonsense. That was on the plains of Shinar. Babylon, the city, eventually did rise and it rose to significant prominence. Um, Hammurabi, uh, then many centuries later, then you get around 600 B.C., and then you have what's called the Neo-Babylonian Empire. That's Nebuchadnezzar, and he had the famous hanging gardens. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He was fabulously wealthy, and he was a juggernaut militarily. That city of Babylon was probably prompted in many respects by the devil himself, uh, trying to rebuild. You see, Babylon is the devil's city. What's God's city? Jerusalem. The Bible has been um, described as the tale of two cities, and it kind of is. Jerusalem, God's city, and all that happens there, and then Babylon. Is there a city named Babylon currently? Nope. Hasn't really even been around since probably the, oh, probably right before Jesus' return. But make no mistake, the Bible is very clear it will be built again one day. And it's going to be built by the Antichrist. When the church is gone, during that seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist is going to capture all of the nations of the world. He's going to be supernaturally brilliant. He's going to be an economic genius. He's going to be a political orator that the earth had never seen. And he is going to then eventually coerce all of the finances of the world to flow through him. What kind of a city could you build if you had all the money in the world at your disposal? It's going to be a fabulous, absolutely astounding, jaw-dropping city. And I showed you when we went over that, uh, the city of Dubai um, is pretty spectacular. And that was built with uh, some oil money, but mostly business speculation. And what's fascinating is everything from their indoor um, snow alpine experience. <laughs> when it's 110 degrees outside, go to this place and it's a ski slope, a nice chilly 31 degrees. And then of course the tallest building in the world. All of those fabulous structures were built in less than seven years. I showed you that to show you that's what a few rich guys and billionaires, when they put their mind to it, what they can build. What kind of city will be this Babylon when the devil once again says, I'm going to go to the plains of Shinar. And there's just a few buildings there now. Um, Saddam Hussein was in the process of rebuilding that city of Babylon. It's about 70 miles outside of current day Baghdad. It's going to rise again, and it's going to be so fabulous that all the humans will poke their chests out and they'll say, oh, look what we've done. And God says, really, watch this. And in one hour, it's destroyed. That's what this is likely in reference to. Some 700 B.C., here is Isaiah prophesying what we'll know later as Revelation 17 and 18. That city is no more. And also, too, in general terms, all the cities that the humans take such pride in, they're not going to fare well in the Great Tribulation. Why? Because evil men are going to be bombing each other like crazy. Verse 3. Therefore, the strong people, the humans who didn't take the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation, and they survived, will glorify you. There's going to be some humans that are going to make it through. And the city of the terrible nations, those once run by non-believers, they're going to fear you now. And now you, uh, these cities run by believers, for you, God, and all the survivors and everything, you have been a strength to the poor. 
It would seem that God is certainly going to take supernatural care of the 144,000, but it would seem that there's others that God supernaturally is going to see through the great tribulation. Because when Jesus sets up his millennial reign, those believers, those humans, are going to be the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. God's going to fix all the damage that the humans have done. He's going to fix it. He's going to return it to an Eden-like condition. Remember, we looked at it also. Some of the details is uh, the animals won't be going Discovery Channel on the other animals. That's going to be nice. Did you know that when Adam and Eve uh, were first put in the Garden of Eden, guess what they ate? Well, they ate ho-hos, of course. But they didn't eat meat. Um, every creature was an herbivore. You mean dinosaurs too? Yeah, somehow, some way. But what about the fossils of their really big, huge, gnarly teeth? Something happened after the flood. The atmosphere changed. Remember, before the flood, they were living almost a thousand years. Something happened to that protective canopy of water suspended in the atmosphere. It used to diffuse the direct rays of the sun around the entire planet. And it would seem that there was an even climate that didn't alter, didn't change much. How do you know? Because the Bible says it didn't rain with the typical water pattern that we're used to. The hot sun at the equator uh, draws up dihydrogen oxide, H2O, from the oceans and then the wind currents because of the movement of the earth called the Coriolis effect, the little curly cues of the storm systems. And it moves it over the land and, and then it precipitates there through color, through um, temperature changes and so on. And then all that rain then moves back down and the whole water cycle starts over again. Before the flood, that never happened. The earth, it would seem, was not... Um, unevenly heated like it is today, hot at the equator, cold at the poles. God is going to replace that water canopy, it would seem, and there's going to be another uniform, beautiful temperature across the surface of the earth. Well, what about those dinosaurs? The dinosaurs, by the way, many of the dinosaurs made it because they were on the ark, <laughs> and we see some of them survive even to this day. But something happened after the flood God said, now things are going to change, Noah and Mrs. Noah and the boys. Now there's going to be carnivores. You can eat the meat of the animals. And so did the other animals as well. And everything began to change dramatically. It's my supposition. I'm, not, I'm way far afield here. I think Darwin was on to something. As you know, he was on the Galapagos Island and he noticed that the finches, the islands were so far apart for one another that they couldn't really transmigrate across these lengthy uh, stretches of ocean. So the finches on one island had stubby short beaks and finches, same species on another island, had long narrow needle-like beaks. And then Darwin found that on the one island with a squat strong beaks. There was mostly seeds to eat there. And then the ones with the long needle-like beaks, they were insects that had to, they had, to, they had to bore out of the wood fibers and so on. And so he said, well, look at that. The food supply altered the genetics or the, the uh, features of the animal. And then he began to postulate, well, if they can change within a species, it must be that you can change from species to another species. Well, let me ask you, are there large changes within a species? For instance, uh, Rick has a little tiny, a little lap dog. No, he doesn't. He doesn't really have one. But if you got a dog, I bet that'd be the one you'd get. And you'd carry him in a little purse with you wherever you go. <laughs> but are there little tiny dogs? Are there really large dogs? But they're still what? They're still dogs. Um, I've told you before, but in my science class, a little fruit fly called Drosophila melanogaster, we did some horrific things to little Drosophila. And they have the benefit is that they don't live very long, and so they procreate very quickly. And you can watch... Um, um, generation after generation. In my classroom, we got up to 12 generations. And the fruit flies we started with after we bombarded them with carcinogens of all kinds. By the time 12 generations, there were some freaky looking fruit flies. And then I read that there have been 
There have been studies that have taken 2,000 generations of fruit flies and made some freaky fruit flies. But here's the difference. Even though environmental pressure will change noticeably the species within the species, never did Drosophila melanogaster turn into Drosophila domesticus. Does that make sense? It was always a fruit fly. Freaky looking fruit fly. But it was a fruit fly, not a dragonfly, not a housefly. The fossil record says very distinctly that there are species and then there are species. But there are not transitional species. Ah, oh, but I've seen the I've seen the skulls, you know, of the Here's eight man, and then little less eight man, little less and less, and pretty soon there's Homo sapien, and then there's an NFL football player right there. <laughs> and you need to know something that those skulls, those transitionary skulls, were never found in that condition. Oh, how'd they come up with that transitional bone? That's not a bone. They found a tooth, they found a cheekbone. And then artist rendition took care of the rest. If you don't believe me, check it out. Humans, Homo sapiens, supposedly show up on planet Earth in the fossil record about a million and a half BC. Well, perhaps. But here's the point. Why is the missing leak missing? Because it doesn't exist. The fossil record shows plainly species and different species. Some species died out entirely because of environmental changes. That's the dinosaurs. In my opinion, the, the new environmental conditions of a post-worldwide flood Earth was such that that's when many of the creatures probably within their species began to develop um, flesh-tearing teeth. I don't know why we went all the way over there, Rick. Why do you always have me do that? Back to our study. Back to our study. There is satisfying answers to all of the fossil record. There are satisfying answers to much of what science has been discovering over and over and over. Did you know that the book of Isaiah, we haven't gotten there yet, but in chapter 49, it's going to talk about the circle of the earth. Do you know that? Circle of the earth? Yeah, that's 300 years before um, Pythagoras who was one of the first people to say, you know what? I don't think the earth is flat at all. I think it's round. And the Greeks went on for some very precise measurements and did a pretty good job. 300 years before Pythagoras, here's your Bible saying that the Lord sits above the circle of the earth. Do you know the Bible knew about bacteria? 3,000 years before Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope. What? Yeah. It tells moms... Don't circumcise your son until the, remember what day? The eighth day. Doctors know, well, yeah, the, the newborn at first is getting mom's um, immunization through mother's milk. And on average, guess how many days it takes for the, the baby's immune system to kick in? About eight days. And there's lots of other examples of that. The book your, the Bible, the, the book that is in your lap right now, is not a science book per se, but it, it talks about things other than bona fide supernatural miracles. It talks about things that the scientists have taken centuries and centuries to catch up to. The God particle, discovered in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider in, in um, I almost said Susanville. No, Switzerland. <laughs> Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And here is Isaiah talking about things that are yet future even to us. When God comes back in, in Revelation chapter 19, he has given the humans every opportunity, every opportunity to get saved. Many do, but a huge proportion don't. Verse 4 again. For you, God, remember the 144,000 survivors of the Great Tribulation, for you have been a strength to those guys, the poor. Literally, that word is feeble and helpless. You've been a strength to the needy. 
Um, that's the Hebrew word ebion, and it means oppressed. Did the Antichrist oppress a few people? Yeah. And in his distress, the great tribulation, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, and a bl for the blast of the terrible ones. Uh, that's a reference to the demons. Remember in the second half of the great tribulation, the demons who currently have some access to heaven, namely Lucifer, where is Lucifer? Well, he's in Washington, D.C., or he's in Moscow. Probably not. The Bible says you know where he spends most of his time? Tattling on you. He's before the Lord. He's the accuser of the brethren day and night. He's going to be ousted out of any access and confined to the surface of the earth. And then all the demons that were so heinous that God took them to a place called the abyss, the abuso, and put a gate over them in some fashion, at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, that gate is opened up and all those demons come out. So the demons have been torturing the humans on the surface of the earth. That's what this is a reference to. A shade from the heat and for the blast of the terrible ones. Those are the demons released from the pit. Lucifer and other demons confined to the surface of the earth. The second half of the Great Tribulation. That was a storm. It's like a storm against the wall. The idea is, but it didn't break you, survivor. Tribulation saints. Verse 5. You, the believing survivors that made it through, you're going to reduce the noise of the aliens. Fascinating word. Another idea of those accusers of God. Are they demonic? It could be. Or are they just non-Israel people? Because the Antichrist, of course, was taunting. The Bible tells us many times through the Great Tribulation, he's literally railing, shaking a fist at God and the raptured church. You will reduce the noise of those aliens as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud, the song of the terrible ones, again, probably a reference to those demons, will be diminished. You made it. You survived the great tribulation and you silence the threats of the Antichrist like a cloud silences the heat of the sun. Verse 6. And in this mountain, talking about Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees. If you're a winemaker, you know about this. This is the best of the best wine, aged to perfection. A feast of wines on the lees and of fat things full of marrow, well-refined wines. By the way, do you know that uh, symbolically, uh, wine is a model of joy. Verse 7, and he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast. This is, this is life to me today. It means the gloom, a cloud of gloom over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. Have you been feeling it, Harvest? It's like a gloom all over. I've, I've been feeling it now for quite a while. Is it the COVID thing? I don't know. It's indefinable. But I've noticed that things don't look like they used to. There's a kind of a gloom over. Why? Because the events of the book of Revelation are coming soon. And the gloom that we experience is suddenly going to be transformed in a moment at God's rapture when we're with him. And he's going to talk about that in a minute. A gloom, a cloud of gloom, a heaviness over America. Was it just me or did you sense it even at the wonderful opening of the Olympics this year? I felt it. Well, it's the, it's the COVID gloom cloud. Could be, could be. But there's a thing that the, the Olympics sort of used to be, a shining example of humans dropping their differences for a while and coming together. There's a gloom. Harvest, the gloom is going to be gone one day. That's for us. This gloom specifically is likely a reference to the heaviness and gloom and destruction of the great tribulation. Verse 8, And he, Jesus, will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. Hold your finger here. Let's go check it out. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 21. 
It's an important concept for anyone sort of under the shadow of the gloom. <laughs> chapter 21, the book of Revelation. Chapter 21. After the great tribulation is done, after the thousand year reign of Jesus, all the demons have been incarcerated for that thousand years. Uh, spiritual warfare will not be a factor in the millennial reign. Planet Earth is going to be like Eden again. The animals are going to eat. Uh, they're going to be herbivores. The Bible says that the lion will eat straw like an ox. Maybe all their teeth will change again. I don't know. But after that, the Bible says that the Lord allows Lucifer to be let out of prison one more time. And in a perfect earth, temperature perfect, plenty of food and water. You probably don't have to go very far because the Bible says everybody lives under their own vine. Uh, you know how hard you have to work today to make a garden? How do you have to beat back the weeds? Why do weeds grow so easily? And my tomatoes, it's like pulling teeth. It's going to be the opposite. The earth is going to push forth perfect produce. So you don't have to go very far. Lucifer is going to be let out and he's going to whisper in the ear of all the humans, you can have it better, seriously, better than Jesus himself on the planet and all those perfect conditions. But how many of the humans will buy this lie one more time? Most of the humans on the earth. Chapter 21. Chapter 20 was... God says, okay, Lucifer, they all, all of Lucifer's humans' armies gather around Jerusalem. Get them, you know. And that's when God blows the whistle. All right, everybody out of the pool. That's Judgment Day. After Judgment Day, chapter 21, verse 1. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. The sea could be literal oceans, but I believe it's metaphoric in the sense of what does the Bible say a restless sea is? It's humans who aren't saved, unrighteous. There's not going to be any more undulating masses of discontent. That's what I believe it means. Skip down in the interest of time, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's you and me, you guys. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying Isaiah talked about that. You can write Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Write in your margin here, Isaiah 65, verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17 says that the former things will no longer come to mind. Back to our Isaiah study in chapter 26. Part, could it really be complete joy and contentment if we were thinking of family members or loved ones who aren't with you? I think so. God says, I'm going to remove any footprint that evil made on the planet or in heaven. And God is going to, it would seem, erase our memory. And we will have no memory of those that aren't with us. It's going to be a particular gnashing, terrible agony for the people separated from God. They're going to remember us. And remember, once on Judgment Day, they have a moment where they're standing before the glory of the Lord. And they're going to see all what, what perfect love, beauty, order, family, anything that's truly good, purpose, a sense of why I am what I am, and, and relationship, everything that God is and every good thing he has ever invented is going to be pulsating with light and power and a love that is indescribable. And the people who rejected God all of their life, no matter what God did to try to open their eyes, to, to plead with them, don't stay in darkness. I've paid for every sin, but I'm not going to force my love upon you. I've paid for all the sin, but I hold out salvation. It's your choice. 
But those people, for whatever reason, who refuse that all of their life, they get a glimpse on Judgment Day of all the pulsating light, beauty, power, purpose. Right before the door is shut, they'll remember that. They'll be in a place of darkness, torture, demons still picking on humans, humans picking on other humans. It's pretty awful. No rest. Why? Well, because anything God is won't be in hell. So the Bible says that rest of the righteous. God invented sleep, if that's the right term. He invented a place of deep breath and just relax without the fear of somebody breaking down your door. That's a God thing. There won't be in hell. There won't be any rest. They'll be forever and ever and ever. All the things that God are not will be there. And the memory of you who witnessed to them and pleaded with them, please receive Jesus' as free gift. No, because you thought you knew better. They'll remember, but us with the Lord will have no memory of that. Back to Isaiah. One more time, verse 8. He, God, Jesus, will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from their eyes. Right near margin there, Revelation 21, verse 4. The rebuke of his people. What is the singular rebuke of, of, of really any human? It's the rejecting of Jesus as Savior. And for the Jews, rejecting Jesus as Messiah. That's going to be done because he, God, will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken, verse 9, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is your God. We're going to see Jesus. Everyone's going to see him. There in Jerusalem, there he is. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Oh, it's going to be a glorious time. Verse 10, for on this mountain, Mount Zion, where Jerusalem currently sits, the hand of the Lord will rest. And Moab shall be trampled down under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. God's got a lot of tough stuff to say about Moab. Moab is where Esau settled, and Esau hated God's birthright. He sold it to his younger brother Jacob for a bowl of beans. And a whole lot of trouble came out of Moab. No more, verse 11, and he will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches out to swim. And he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your walls, he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground down to the dust. That's all going to be accomplished by the seven-year millennial reign of the Lord. Um, Verse or chapter 26. Now we're going to be introduced into a song. Um, you'll notice how it lays out in your Bible. There are, these are lyrics. And they're going to be set to some kind of tune. Don't know what it'll be like. Um, but this is this song. Chapter 26. And in that day, the millennial reign. Not the new Jerusalem, not just yet. Pardon me, but in the millennial reign. Where Jesus is physically on the planet. And I'm going to show you and remind us, he's going to be uh, in a temple that he's going to construct. And then we'll be with him uh, in our new bodies that we got at the rapture. And then there'll be humans as well. And as I said, planet Earth is going to be reconstituted back to its Eden-like condition. And in that day, the millennial reign, how long will it be for? A thousand years. This song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, Jerusalem in the millennial temple is, gonna, is what they're referring to. And God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Are you ready, Blake? Let, let's remind, let's take a journey back if you don't mind. This is all explained in the book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Real quickly, here is an artist's rendition of Moses' tabernacle, a very humble thing. Build it exactly like this. And so all the colors and all the metallurgy, silver for some things, bronze for others, gold for other instruments, all with a powerful model of Jesus Christ. Well, that's kind of a scale model of how that looked. Let's go to our next one. 
This is a model, an artist's rendition of Solomon's temple. Solomon says, yeah, did you notice that God's temple, the outer garment or that tent inside were gold and beautiful, precious things. But it was all covered over by four layers. And the fourth layer, remember what that was made of? Shoe leather. <laughs> Can you imagine bringing someone to your, to your temple? Hey, uh, our God back in Babylon is this and that and gold this and gold that. What do you got? Well, we got our tabernacle, you know. And they look at it and from the outside, all they see is what? Shoe leather. And that was told to Moses to make it that way. Why? Because the whole temple was a model of Jesus Christ. The only physical description we have of Jesus' appearance is in Isaiah chapter 53. Do you know that he had no form or comeliness that we would desire him? He was very plain, and God designed it that way. So if you have a picture of Jesus on your 3D, 3D picture of Jesus on your coffee table Bible, and he's got flowing hair and rich Mediterranean features and a square Roman jaw and nose, no, he was very plain. And when you got to the tabernacle of the Jews, the outer level was, layer was common shoe leather. When humans want to build a religion, it looks very different from when God does. Because even that is a model that God himself is going to zip up a shoe leather exterior in the form of skin and bone. Fascinating. Solomon looks at God's simple shoe leather clad tabernacle and says, no, no, no. Solomon was a wise man. God made him so. And so Solomon said, we got some coin now. We're doing well. Um, we had so much gold that silver is like pasha, pasha. So what he does is he builds God this house. God told his dad, David, when David said, here I live in a palace and you live in the tent of shoe leather. God says, I'm okay with that, David. But I want to build you a house. <laughs> please, please, please. David, you don't have to do that because I don't live in a house. The tabernacle is just kind of a model of how I work. I want to build a temple. Okay, David. But you can't build it, but your son will build it. And boy, did Solomon build it. Fascinating. Uh, that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, in the year 587 B.C. So then Jerusalem, the Jews go off to Babylon, and they come back 70 years later, and they build a small-ish sort of tabernacle, not nearly as beautiful as Solomon's. In fact, Ezra and Nehemiah, they talk about it. And the old guys who knew and saw what Solomon's temple was like, when they come back and they see the little hutch uh, that they build, they go, this is nothing like Solomon's great temple. And that was the temple that lasted until Herod the Great. And so what he did is he says, I'm going to build you this. And so go ahead. Here is uh, the third tabernacle, or I should say the Moses tabernacle was the first one. Solomon's temple was built out of stone and what have you, and, and gold and what have you. There's your first temple. Here's the second temple. This is Herod's temple. This is the temple, what it probably looked like about the time that Jesus visited it. It was a pretty impressive structure. The outer court, the inner court, all the gold, the two big columns in the front, you know, 60 foot high was the ceiling. It was impressive. Well, the, the Lord allowed the Romans to destroy this temple in the year 70 AD. Is there a temple now? Nope. You have the Dome of the Rock, but that's an, uh, that's an Islamic structure. Um, but God says it's going to build, God says there's going to be a third temple. Who's going to build the third temple? The Antichrist is. So the Jews win back Israel in 1948, but they didn't have Jerusalem. They don't get Jerusalem until uh, 1967 in the Six Days War. And they get Jerusalem, we, now we can build our temple. Well, no, they can't because 900 million Islamics said, you can't touch it because our holy shrine is there. The Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Omar. So today, Jerusalem belongs to the Jews, but the Temple Mount has not been yet, a temple hasn't been built yet. The Antichrist will build one. Finally, in Ezekiel chapter 40, go ahead. 
We have this structure. And the reason that we can kind of reconstruct that in an artist's rendition is because there's so many specific details. It is huge. It's 750 feet on a square. Hit our go button. Here is the American football field in relative size. Go ahead. Here's the first tabernacle. Eat little tiny thing. There's Moses' tabernacle. There's your shoe leather. Go ahead. Here's Solomon's temple, pretty good size. And then Herod the Great, go ahead. Here's his relative size. Compared to all those, watch how big the millennial temple of Jesus will be. Go ahead. Bang, it's going to be that big. Square. And we went all through that. And if that interests you, get our study on Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Go ahead. Um, notice too, there's a little creek. Hit the go button. That little creek right there happens uh, when Jesus touches down in Revelation 19. He, he, tests, he touches down on the Mount of Olives. Why the Mount of Olives? Um, where did the glory of the Lord, when Israel, because of her idolatry and misbehaving, is taking off, taken off to exile, where did the glory of the Lord leave Jerusalem? From the Mount of Olives. Jesus shows up years later on Palm Sunday. If they would have received Jesus as their Messiah, the glory of the Lord, Jesus himself standing on the Mount of Olives, would have started. The thousand-year reign would have started. But did, Jesus, did they receive Jesus as Messiah? No. Weren't they laying down the palm branches and the coats and singing, blessed is he, Messiah, who comes in the name of the Lord, Jehovah God, Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. Well, yeah, for a minute. And you remember Jesus stopped the whole parade and wept? Why? Because he knew that they were, he was going to go down the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives into the East Gate and instead of kicking out Romans and beginning the millennial reign of Messiah by force, military action, what did Jesus do instead? He cleansed the temple because of all the merchandising they had done to God's house. He knew that was going to happen. And as a nation, Israel goes, ew, that's not what Messiah is supposed to do, so you must not be our Messiah. Jesus knew that he was going to be rejected on that day. The glory of the Lord had returned to the Mount of Olives. But they rejected him. He's crucified. Three days later, he raises. He hangs with the disciples for another 40 days. He ascends from what geographic location? The Mount of Olives. Where's he coming back to? Revelation 19, where is his first sandal print going to be impressed upon the surface of the earth? The Mount of Olives. See how it all? That's the real uh, triumphal entry, by the way. But when he does that, the Bible says, crack! The Mount of Olives is going is to heave and split, and there's going to come a, a new fountain of water, and it's going to start underneath the temple. And it's going to run out of that east gate and run all the way through this new fissure all the way down to the Dead Sea. But God's going to fix the Dead Sea as well. The Dead Sea is not going to be dead anymore. During the thousand-year millennial reign, that creek is still going to be running. We're in chapter 26. Let's get back to that song. Now in verse 2, open the gates. Go ahead and leave that up if you would, uh, Blake. Open the gates. What gates? Those gates. Jesus' millennial temple. And as I said, it takes eight chapters for God to describe the specifics on how far this is from that. And what happens at these gates and who does what. It's all prescribed there. So open the gates. Those gates. That the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. This is the, the new, or uh, this is the millennial reign. And so who's the righteous nation? It's Israel. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. That's one of those verses in the book of Isaiah you probably have had highlighted for a number of years. One more time. Verse 3. You, my Lord God, how strong is God? 
as strong as it gets. What resources does he have? All the resources. You, God, will keep anybody in perfect peace. Who watches a lot of television? Or who, who, who has a this or that? Or, or, or who knows? No, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Verse four, trust in the Lord forever for in Yah, interesting, one of the names of Yahweh or Jehovah. For Yah, the Lord, notice capital L, capital O, R, and D. If we were to read this in Hebrew, there would be four Hebrew letters. Y, H, W, H, Yahweh. That's where we're gonna get our word, uh, Jehovah, the eternal existing one. Is everlasting strength, verse five, for he brings down those who dwell on high and the lofty city, notice singular. Remember that Babylon, a man's very best efforts ever. And remember how it went down in one hour. It's not looking so hot now compared to the beauty of what God is gonna do. That's just the architecture. What's it going to be like when Jesus himself is literally walking the aisles? Earlier on, last chapter, Isaiah said, the sun and the moon, their glory will have nothing on when the glory of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus, is present and walking around. Oh, and by the way, you can talk to him. He, the Lord, laid that city low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. The feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Uh, the devil and the Antichrist. That little bit of land in Babylon was the most prized real estate ever. And for about seven years, oh, you, could, you couldn't afford an apartment there. It's just too expensive. Now, in the millennial reign, it's the cheapest real estate on earth. Verse 7, the way of the just is is uprightness, O oh, most upright, you weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O oh Lord, we have waited for you. And the desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. Oh, it's going to be glorious when he's there. Verse 9, with my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. We waited for you, Lord, the people of Judah say. We've desired you in the night and sought you in the morning during those dark days of the, of the, of the tribulation. But now it's all worth it. Verse 10, let grace be shown to the wicked. This is kind of an idea of uh, there will be some who will make it through the tribulation who are not saved. That's mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, the separating of the sheep and the goats. After Jesus comes back, after the tribulation, he dispatches all of the forces hacking themselves to pieces on the, in the valley of Megiddo. The Bible says then he's going to give the humans one more shot. There will still be those who aren't believers. Can you believe that? So then the Bible says they'll still be posers and he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. There's still time. Look at this. After the great tribulation, after Jesus touches down on the earth, let grace be shown to the wicked. There's still some time. And still, all that grace, Jesus standing right in front of them. How was it possible that there will be those who are all but I'm not going to submit to you. Still. Yet he, those refusing that witness, will not learn righteousness. Standing the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, they're going to be people that are going to be tapping their foot. No. They will not learn righteousness in the land of uprightness. He will deal unjustly these people, they're going to continue to sin. They're going to continue to live on their own and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. And the Lord 
Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they will see and be ashamed for their envy of the people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. That's Matthew 25, the separating of the sheep and the goats. And when God finally does say, seriously, I'm standing right in front of you. Seriously? I'm going to have to bring a judgment. When he begins the literal beginning of the millennial reign, every human who begins that thousand year reign of the Lord after Matthew 25 and the separating of the sheep and the goats to begin, everybody will be a believer. Verse 12. By the way, will those subsequent generations, how about their kids? Will they all be believers? We hope most of them will be. What about the third generation? What about the 17th generation? Here's the point of the great, of, of the Lord's millennial reign. It's full circle. In the Garden of Eden, how perfect was the creation? Perfect. There was only one stipulation, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right now, you can't think of evil. Believe me, you'd like it to stay that way. Because the moment you know evil and good, you gotta make a choice. And it takes just one choice of evil that now you're no longer pure and we've broken fellowship. Started in Eden. By the time it's all done in the thousand year reign, you're in Eden again. It's full circle. Jesus is on the, on the planet. New body believers saying, you don't want to do that. And some human going, you shut up, you know, you new body believer. But you don't want to go there. There's no spiritual warfare because all the demons are in jail. And still there will be humans in the millennial reign who will act up. And ultimately at the end of the thousand years, when Lucifer is let go, let out, those are the ones that he will recruit. But it'll be just a small little group, right? Bible says, as the sands of the sea. Fascinating. Full circle. Humans, I'm going to give you a chance for you to hang on to the purity that I, that I made all things in. How did the humans do? And then all through every other option, through the law. Okay, I'll write it down for you. Do this and don't do that. And when you mess up, go to the temple. How do humans do then? <clears throat> all right, I'll make it even more simple. I'll pay for everybody's sin. And all you have to do is just receive it. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then without thinking about it, you're going to be walking in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. How are the humans doing when it's as simple as just believe how's it going back full circle in the millennial reign perfect earth how are the humans going to do then and that's why God by the time judgment day happens God says do you see that I have done everything to let the humans try to live a holy life. What's the answer? They can't. Do you see now why I have to judge all evil and separate evil completely? There's the compartment of hell. Close the door. Heaven and the new Jerusalem will enjoy if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But what did it cost? By the time Judgment Day happens, here's another thing that people aren't aware of very often. Do you know who is going to be rejecting and saying, I want my lawyer as they move into outer darkness? You know who's going to be complaining against that judgment? Who's going to be complaining? Nobody. Not even Lucifer. Because I've done it all. And by the time Judgment Day happens, you know what everyone will say? Righteous and true. You were right when you judged evil. And that includes me. Because I rejected your every attempt to keep me out. I deserve this separation. Interesting. 
Let's finish up here real quickly. Verse 14. Pardon me, verse 13. Lord, you will establish peace for us in the millennial reign, for you have also done all of our works for us. Everything that we did was actually because you worked through us. Verse 13. O Lord, our God, masters beside you, uh, human kings, presidents, dictators, idols, they didn't cut it, have had dominion over us, but, you, but by you only we make mention of, really, we worship. We worship your name. Verse 14, they're dead and they will not live. They are deceased and they will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory perish. No matter how the huge personalities were, religious founders, they're dead. Biblical Christianity is the only belief system. The humans don't even think about trying to ascend to God's level because you'll never make it. We're sinful to the core. Biblical Christianity is the only belief system that says God who created everything zipped up a human suit and came to our level to save us. Verse 15. You have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. This is a reference to Joshua chapter 1, verse 4. The promised land is not that little bit of land sliver of Israel today. The borders of Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, the promised land is from the Nile to the west to the Euphrates in the east, north to current day Lebanon, and south to the Negev or the Gulf of Elat. When has Israel ever seen and seized that much land? They never have, but they will. That's what this verse is in reference to. Verse 16. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. And as a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs when she draws near the time of delivery, so you have been in your, so we have been in your sight. In other words, for Israel, I know the great tribulation was really, really hard. But the song that they're singing says, but you heard us. We, as a people of Israel, needed the squeezing. We didn't believe you when you told us, you're going to reject me. But now we know. But watch, there's another group here. Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, we have as it were, brought forth wind. We have, no, we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have inhabitants of the world fallen. This is another group. They too went through the great tribulation. But instead of saying, ding, you're right, God. I've been wrong. And it was the pain of tribulation that finally allowed me to say, I wasn't correct. Did you know that there's a whole group of people that are going to go through the same tribulation, as I said, before the separating of the sheep and the goats? They're going to say, well, we, we went through it too. We didn't learn a thing. We didn't see a thing. And now we're going to, in verse number 19, chapter 26, let's go in verse number 19. Oh, I was going to say, the same is true for us today, by the way. Have you ever noticed it? When we go through our trials and tribulations, you have an option. God allowed this holy squeeze not to blow us up, but to finally help us to stop kicking against him. So through any trial or tribulation, you can become better. What's the other option? You can become bitter. God did this to me. That's going to be the separating of the sheep and the goats. And finally, the last couple of verses, verses 19 and following. Your dead shall live. Did you know that the rapture of the church, talked about in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that we shall not all sleep, we're not all going to die, uh, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we who are alive and remain will shoot up and meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be awesome, the rapture. And there are people that say, you know that the rapture theory is really not in the Bible. Or some people will say, well, not how you have described it to us, a rapture before the seven-year tribulation. And they'll say, in some cases, 
Did you know that the rapture was a concoction of the Council of Nicaea and a whole bunch of stupid things? Yes, very plainly. The rapture is very plainly described in the New Testament. And look, the rapture described in the Old Testament. Your dead are going to live together with my dead body. They're going to arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust those of you who are in the grave, for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out, circle that, cast out the dead. That's the Hebrew word nephal, and it means to move with great haste. Do you know what the Greek equivalent of this Hebrew word nephal is? Harpazo. This is the rapture in the Old Testament. Come, my people. Hey, that, right, that lines up with Revelation chapter four. If you didn't know it, Revelation chapter four is a videotape of the rapture. Come up here, come. And the window in heaven was open. Come, my people. Here it is depicted in the Old Testament. Enter your chambers. We sang it tonight. The way God, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus will go on to say, to answer Thomas, where are you going? I go to prepare a place for you. Mansions for you. Really, the word is chambers. That where I am, you will be also. And I'm going to bring you to myself. At the rapture, we're going to hear, come! And then we will soon see our uh, John chapter 14, chambers. And shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little while. Seven years, the great tribulation. Until the indignation. You can't say that's the, that's the tribulation. Yes, I can. Because indignation, right in your margin there, that's Isaiah 10, verse 24 through 27. Isaiah 10, 24 says... The Assyrian, which is one of the Old Testament monikers of the Antichrist, the Assyrian shall strike for a very little while and then his indignation will cease. Hide for a moment until the indignation is past. Seven years. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. That's Revelation 19, him coming down, stepping on the Mount of Olives, and dispatching all the combatants in the valley of Armageddon. And the earth will also disclose her blood and will no longer cover her slain. Wars are going to finally cease. Amen. How many of you didn't know that the rapture is detailed in the Old Testament? Well, there it is. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this reminder that hang in there. Just keep showing up. There is a, a cloud. There is a, there is a veil of sorts, and you've noticed it. The closer the book of Revelation and the events thereof are approaching, the more that curtain of gloom you're going to notice and it's going to get even worse for those who missed salvation, really refused salvation. And they're going to have to go through this great tribulation. We want to thank you tonight, Lord Jesus, those of us who have received you as our Lord and our Savior. I committed our life to you, Lord. We won't be there. Where will we be? We will have heard, come! We will be nestled within our chambers, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. That's a great assurance, Lord. And we can't wait for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. A lot of prophecy tonight. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.